Thanks. Well, this paper is slightly out of sequence because it was supposed to be on late this afternoon with Troy Duncan looking at clerical reforms there in Newcastle. But I think it's actually quite fitting to come now because we're kind of gradually working our way back towards the, uh, the pressure front of John's very excellent uh, open paper on contemporary uh, scenes. And when one thinks of the concept uh, that of Newcastle, the historian at least tends naturally to think of the Great Depression. 1930s, the desperate struggle, work and sustenance, uh, the anti eviction riots, and the battles with councils over unemployed workers' camps. One doesn't tend to think of Morpeth in the same breath as a centre of radical thinking or action during the Depression. Yet it was at Morpeth that a small team of Christian men at St John's Theological College built a team and a journal that became associated with the brand radical Newcastle. The men were Ernest Bergman. That's an old photo of him, actually, in old age. I think it's quite nice to have him poised with an axe. <laughs> uh, he was warden at St John's College. His deputy, the Chinese Australian Roy Lee, who uh, left Morpeth eventually and had to seek a job outside, became the uh, dean of Oxford, actually, the, the Oxford uh, University Church uh, in England because he couldn't get a job here any longer. And the third uh, member who I will talk about uh, very briefly is AP or Peter Elgin, of course, uh, the rector of, of St James Hall at the time. Today I want to talk briefly about the pattern of thinking and the range of activity of these men within Newcastle and its surrounds and suggest how they might find a home within the present Valley Newcastle project. But a home that I think requires some examination of the foundations on which it's built. The condition of Newcastle and the coalfields on the eve of the depression is, of course, uh, well known. A long tradition of intermittent unemployment among miners and heavy industry work workers dating back at least to the early 1920s. A uh, closure of most collieries in the Northern District between 1929 and May 1930, which affected over 10,000 mine workers and indirectly affected thousands more railway men, wharf labourers turners and fitters, boiler makers and iron workers. There was a floating population of unskilled labour dependent on picking up work at the company gates, and increasing numbers of itinerant, unhoused workers and their families relying on councils to provide some camping spaces for them. Incidentally, uh, the conflict among the ten or so councils making up Greater Newcastle in the 1930s over whether to house these people and the negative views of many of their own ratepayers must be counted into the equation when measuring just how radical Newcastle's community was uh, at this time. Sheila Gray, in a very nice little 1984 study of uh, Newcastle during the Depression, concludes that Newcastle was a lot quieter than Sydney and Wollongong in uh, protesting Depression conditions. She concludes that it was a conservative community which had become kind of accustomed to suffering and therefore inured to uh, what was going on in many ways. Well, it's well known, of course, that the churches, especially the Protestant churches, were all prepared, ill prepared, for the erosion of uh, community life that came with the Depression. I've dealt with their divisions and, the de and their defeatism uh, in my biography of Bergen, as has Sheila Gray in her 1984 study. Oddly enough, given its conservative uh, reputation, the Anglican Church uh, was the place where debate really went on. Bergman and his uh, Morgoth Mafia, as it uh, came to be termed, were at their forefront. Bergman and Lee uh, believed in a church whose brief was to reform society and to sensitise the conscience of the community. Bergman knew religion was a political thing, or had a political reach if the Gospels were to be taken seriously. His views of capitalism weren't entirely systematic. He was an ideas man rather than a disciplined philosopher or a political thinker. But he believed and preached that capitalism was the septic centre, uh, his words, of 20th century civilization, an outworn and discredited, pol discredited policy, unable to lead the world without its contemporary discontents. An echo, an echo from the past, incidentally, for the occupied movement uh, of today. He had strong views on the developing class warfare, tracing everything back in a rather simplistic judgment on oppression economics to the corruption of the owning classes, again, their uh, uh, residence.
day. And he foresaw Western society moving steadily and painfully forward towards working class revolution and collapse. Of course, he was labelled a communist uh, for these views and roundly criticised, though Bergman never was a communist, nor even a Marxist Leninist, even while he was sympathetic uh, to the aspirations of Russians to build a better society using Soviet communism. Bergman learned to use uh, a variety of media to get his messages across. And I'll come back to some of these concepts in this earlier slide later on. Uh, he learned to, to use a variety of media. He believed Parsons needed to tackle the issues of the day from their pulpits, but also in public discussions. He spoke to church groups, he spoke to branches of the ALP, as well as to the Conservative United Australia Party. He spoke to cells of the UWM, the Unemployed Workers Movement, to Toc H, to Rotary, and to anybody else who would, would actually listen to him. He wrote for the Newcastle Morning Herald and had a close relationship with its editor, K.S. McGill, who, though he was a supporter of the ultra-conservative All for Australia League, was essentially an anti-fascist and open to a modern Christian critique of capitalism. McGill gave Bergman a platform that complemented both Bergman's magazine, the Morpeth Review, and his WA lectures to Newcastle and Coalfields classes. Now, I don't have time to explore the Morpeth Review in depth, and I'm hoping uh, that it will become part of this project. I think we at least had a, somebody talking about the Morpeth Review uh, in one of the early meetings. Uh, its birth belongs to the whole set of Christian and humanist impulses on Bergman that had their origins in his Sydney University training and uh, in exposure to the new liberal idealism of the early uh, 20th century. But through the Morpeth Review, uh, radical Newcastle had exposure to a range of experts uh, in industry and government. They included Keynesian economists like E.R. Walker at the University of Sydney, uh, F.R.E. Morden, uh, the historian G. Lee Portis, Keith Hancock, Laurie Fitzhardy, and Freddie Wood, uh, and the lawyer politician H. T. Ebbett, uh, who wrote on the Constitution. Bergman even kept up uh, a correspondence with the Conservative Premier of New South Wales, after Jack Lang, Jack uh, Bertram Stevens, as a sounding board for his ideas for transforming capitalism. I've argued that the Morpeth Review was the first of the quality thinking journals. If you like, it was an interwar equivalent of the Griffith Review or Eureka Street or, or the Monthly. It was the voice of uh, Christian idealism responding in general terms to the widespread notion that Western civilization was in crisis and that capitalism was failing to fulfill its promises of universal prosperity, forgetting instead wealth for the few and unemployment uh, and oppression for the many or as we would say today, outrageous bonuses for CEOs uh, on the one hand, and sharp losses in people's superannuation on the other. Proof so strong. Um, Bergman, Lee and Elkin organised the main lines of thought, which tended to promote idealist solutions to social problems, the need to change attitudes, to educate people more, to restore closer networking communities, Bergman called them organic communities. The Morpeth Review examined topics like uh, poverty in local communities, the gap between science and religion, uh, the vices and virtues of nationalism, the problems presented by international tensions, and the likelihood of future wars. Walter Murdoch wrote for the review, as did McMahon Ball. A.P. Elkin wrote his first pieces on Aboriginal Australia under Bergman's encouragement. And though today uh, Elkin may be regarded warily for his complicity with state regimes control over indigenous culture, these were pioneering attempts to educate Australians about the depth of Aboriginal cultural life. The other front that Bergman operated on in radical ways was the WEA, the Workers Associ Education Association in Newcastle <coughs> and the Hunter. This may be the area, or the area of adult education may be uh, the field I should say, the area of adult education was in fact Bergman Lee's most radical instrument for achieving what they both believed was the first step in revolution. That was to stretch the public mind and to educate the working class to see the world in more sophisticated terms. 
Bergman's teachers at Sydney University have been administrators and teachers to the WEA. William Woodhouse is Professor of Greek, Francis Anderson is philosophy professor, uh, his friend and Anglican clerical colleague, and the later Professor of History at Adelaide University, uh, G. B. Fortis, was the first to be got Bergman uh, involved. Bergman taught the new psychology to WEA students in both Armadale and Newcastle throughout the 1920s and 1930s. He introduced Newcastle to Freud to the interpretation of dreams, to taboo subjects like sex and infantile, infantile drives. Bergman's WEA classes were, in fact, the premium classes in Newcastle from 1928 onwards, not simply because he talked about sex, but because he was a naturally gifted teacher who threw out big ideas and challenged his classes to debate them with him without any ego or defensiveness. Lloyd Ross said that Bergman's classes worshipped him because he was no highbrow and he never ducked an argument. Well, all of this is part of what has become the Bergman mythology. The sacred history, if you like, that surrounds Bergman's memory. Uh, this is the myth about the radical Bushman cleric uh, who become, uh, became later Bishop of Canberra and Goldman, uh, admired for his social and intellectual activism as warden of Morpeth St John's College. The man who allegedly won the freedom of the Thai Hill eviction rioters for a speech he gave to a public meeting. A cleric very unlike his Anglican brothers, though not other Protestants and Catholics, I have to say, who was prepared, unlike them, to attack government policies and promote radical changes to the structure of capitalism to ensure equity across classes. Bergman's radicalism is supposed to have cost him election to the Anglican uh, Episcopate of Newcastle in 1930 in favour of the much more conservative Francis de Witt Batty. Well, there are in fact holes in this mythology, I think, that raise questions about the nature and extent of radicalism in Newcastle during the Depression years. But this is something that I think the Radical Newcastle Project needs to take seriously. How do we deal with conflicts within historical movements? Uh, which John uh, and, and others have pointed out this morning. For a start, Bergman's critique of capitalism, while outwardly radical in its promotion of quasi-social solutions, wasn't very revolutionary as political philosophy. It didn't offer a serious alternative, practical alternative to capitalist hegemony, nor did he advocate a class revolution, except in general moral uh, and, and social terms. He was never pro-communist. In fact, the Communist Party condemned him as a social fascist. This was partly because of his, of his adhering to his religious Christian worldview, and partly because his solution to the inequities of capitalism was a theory he called rationalisation. This was modelled on Europe's, uh, specifically the Weimar Republic's detailed regulation of industry, which was designed to respect private property, property but prevent excessive competition between industries in the national interest. At its extreme, it meant the state would take over the whole economic and market policy using a council of economic experts, not unlike what confronts the Italian and Greek populations today, incidentally. Now, this may be radical, but it does raise the question of where on a political scale such radicalism lies. I've also argued in my biography that Bergman's failure to become bishop of Newcastle in 1930 had less to do with his radicalism and more to do with the conservative dynamics within Synod and uh, Diocesan Council. Bergman's name was hardly mentioned during the liberations and he lagged behind other contenders right from the start. What all these seeming reservations on my part do is raise for our attention the question of definitions as part of the radical Newcastle project. What does radical actually mean? And I think we've been given some excellent uh, definitions already this morning to, to uh, wrestle with. Is there a really readily accepted consensus about its meaning? Do you have to be a particular political colour or on a specific political or social wing to qualify? How does a project on radical Newcastle deal with the conflicts inherent in so many historical movements and personalities? These are, I think, are interesting questions for us uh, to, uh, to talk about. I'm not saying that Bergman and his mates from Morpeth don't qualify for 
Bergen Tone, definition of radical, was very similar to the one that John gave us this morning. He believed it was the search for the root of a problem. The search for the root of a problem. Whatever reservations one might have about his thinking and that of his colleagues, their ideas went beyond the usual kind of ethical solution to the depression that were being promoted by church leaders at the time, including, indeed, especially among his own Anglican clerical and Episcopal colleagues. Most clerics, if they preached, changed it all, urged their congregations simply not to stand in the way of any changes that might come, rather than take an active part in making them happen. Bergman at least had a program, which he sought to make known to the unemployed and the WEA around Newcastle, and to as broad an audience as would listen to his addresses or read his articles in the paper. His real radicalism lay in trying to rouse the churches to mediate if and when a revolution against capitalism came, by aligning themselves with the working class so that a peaceful transformation of capitalism could occur. Uh, his radicalism was in the way he set out to publicly, publicly disturb minds. Certainly he wasn't seen as mainstream. Uh, certainly he was seen as having his feet planted firmly in the air. And I think he was uh, a radical. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
and we didn't see one here until what, the 1950s. So, um, but you can't fault his, his at least strategic thinking of trying to, to create a team uh, for radical. Yeah, let's talk age. I mean, I, I know. Okay, well, it was quite a story of the thing that was originally It was a sort of next servicemen's uh, so, sort of social welfare network, uh, which um, which gave talks and, and, and made collections and uh, did social work amongst the prior, particularly ex servicemen. Yeah, no, I, I thought it actually might have started in Britain rather than in Australia, I think. I think. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work 
watching it and on in our hedonism. And uh, the, if you compare Bergman and his Christian socialism and so on, which has a pretty good tradition, we say the primitive Methodists on the coal fields in Newcastle, I mean, there were one group which, which wouldn't even have ministers, let alone bishops. You know, were, it was a completely lay church. And many of those people were directly active in the union movement. Um, you know, they weren't communists. There weren't any communists, but the integration between that particular um, domination of tradition and radicalism, working class radicalism, is very explicit and clear. And I just wonder whether or not it actually happens with um, a patriarchal figure like an African bishop. No, well, look, I think actually that's an excellent question. Uh, and it really raises this whole issue of, of the spectrum that I think we have in this project to deal with. What the hell is radicalism? Where does, where does, it, where does it start? Where does it end? What, you know, who can you fit within the, the kind of bookends of, of radicalism? And, and, and is Bergman's radicalism anything like Alf Lynch's radicalism? Uh, and, and I suspect that it's not. I mean, the, the fact that Bergman was, by his fellow bishops, considered uh, the red bishop you know, a, a pico communist um, as, as a, a, a cleric who, even though he was a bushman, used to wear spats to, uh, to you know, formal ecclesiastical conventions because he thought that was what the convention was. I mean, not that he particularly liked that. I mean, you, you, you know, how do you fit something like that into a radical revolution? Uh, and, and I would hope that this project might be able to tolerate um, a lot of ambivalence and, and a lot of colour and movement and uh, difference in diversity uh, in, in the definition of, of radicalism. But you're, you're right, I'm, I'm not keen to hear Troy's, Troy's paper this afternoon, but I think we're going to hear a very different version of clerical radicalism in my world.